So hello, welcome everyone. Um, so uh, welcome to TASK's conversation with civil society leaders. So it's, it's very exciting to have uh, some eminent, um, uh, the CEOs of Trocra and Concern and Oxfam with us today. Um, I, my name is Patrick Paul Walsh and I'm a professor of international development studies in University College Dublin. And it's a pleasure to chair this session and to uh, moderate the questions, etc. So um, I first want to say a little bit about TASK. Um, this is our Ireland's independent think tank for action on social change. It's their 20th anniversary. Um, and it's 20 years of education, promoting education and publishing research for the benefit, uh, influencing policy for the public benefit, influencing, influencing policy and encouraging a more participant and inclusive society at national, European and global levels. And task work, uh, task work supports um, promoting inequality, social inclusion, climate justice and democracy and, and of course we agree this is uh, very important at the moment for the Irish government and citizens of Ireland as we navigate this post uh, pandemic world. Um, so um, I'm firstly going to uh, introduce, we get straight to business, uh, the, the, the speakers will get 10 to 15 minutes to talk and we'll collect questions. Um, so first up is Quiva Dabari from CEO, CEO of Trocra. So Quiva has worked in the development humanitarian field for 25 years. She's been the CEO of Trogra since October 2018. Prior to that, she worked in a range of roles in Trogra and also spent three years as a, a country director with Concern Worldwide in Malawi. Um, Quiva is a leader with a deep commitment to social justice, human rights and equality. And she was the 2021 recipient of the Excellence in Leadership Award from the Charities Institute Ireland and she is currently the chair of the Irish Consortium on Gender-Based uh, Violence. Um, so you have the floor, Quiva, and I'm um, very much looking forward to your intervention. Thank you very much, and I'm delighted to be here today. It's a real honour and a privilege to be asked to speak in this forum. So I'm going to use a few slides, if you don't mind. Um, they will just help us stay a little bit on point with a few of the things that I wanted to say. So maybe, um, Professor Walsh, if you could just let me know that you can see those clearly. Yeah, absolutely. Perfect. Great. OK, so what I want to do in the main is just use a few maps to demonstrate context and then just highlight what I think are the key issues for the sector going forward. Um, and I won't elaborate too much on them because I know that my colleagues will also deepen some of these topics and I want to leave as much as possible for questions and answers. But I'll speak very briefly about some contextual issues around poverty, democracy and civil society space, conflict, COVID and climate, and lastly, localization. First of all, in terms of global poverty, we're all aware of it, but this map I think just highlights very clearly the degree to which extreme poverty is concentrated in a few areas of the world. Something else that's worth noting is that extreme poverty is not just concentrated in these regions, but it's increasingly concentrated in what we call fragile and conflict affected states. So more and more people who are susceptible to extreme poverty are also affected by conflict in their environment. The Global Humanitarian Overview is produced in December every year for the following year. And in December last year, this picture was produced, but by August it had changed. So in December last year, there was a projection that 235 million people would be in need in 2021, but that increased by 40 million by August. So this is just to say that the degree and the pace to which humanitarian need is increasing is almost unprecedented. So Poverty is the global plat the burning platform for agencies like ourselves through a goal and concern. But what are the drivers of poverty and what are we seeing increasingly in our world? So one of the issues that we focus on in Throcra very much is the context within which we work and democracy and the state of democracy. This is another map which again highlights what is the state of democracy across the world? So this comes from the Economist Intelligence Unit. And again, you can see a map just speaks volumes in a very brief glance. You can see the degree to which we have a concentration of authority, authoritarian regimes, certainly in Africa, but also across the Middle East and um, clearly in other regions of the world as well. But the degree to which there are full democracies in the world is actually very, very limited. We in Ireland are very fortunate to be amongst one of the few countries that can be classified as being a full democracy and this is very important because as I'll show now you cannot change systemic problems 
in a society, in an economy, in a culture, unless people are free to speak, to mobilize and to express dissent with the status quo. Civicus, as many of you will know, is a global organization that looks at, in, in, looks at the state of civil society globally, amongst other issues, and supports civil society organizations in terms of freedom of expression, freedom of mobilization, um, and freedom to promote and defend human rights. So every year, Civicus produces an index on civil society space. And again, you see in this map, the degree to which the country, there are countries that are closed, repressed and obstructed in terms of civil society space um, and where civil society space is narrow and where it is open. And again, if you look at where Ireland is, we're one of the few open spaces for civil society in the world. So one point that I'd make is that it's not to be taken for granted. We should use our democracy and use it well, but also that there is a huge mountain to climb in terms of ensuring greater civil society space globally. In terms of both of the above, what we've seen over the course of the last two years is a shift in dynamics. So the shift in dynamics is that over the last decade, we've seen that civil society space has been weakening and fracturing. But with the advent of COVID, what has happened is that many governments worldwide have cracked down on social protest. Let me come on to that now. So this is from Frontline Defenders, an Irish organization, again, many of you will be very familiar with. So what Frontline Defenders are clearly able to show through their tracking year on year of the cases that come to them are, first of all, the degree to which human rights defenders are vulnerable. And by human rights defenders, we mean people who speak out about abuses of human rights that are happening to their communities. The people who are most vulnerable in terms of a cohort within human rights defenders are people working on land, indigenous people, people working on environmental rights. And this will link to climate, as we'll see in a minute. But also women human rights defenders who are working on women's rights are increasingly vulnerable and increasingly being targeted. What we're seeing and linking back to the civil society space issue is that the law is being used as a weapon. So human rights defenders are being criminalized through the use of laws which are on the statute books, but which may have been strengthened, for example, through the introduction of emergency legislation under COVID, issues around public order, assembly, illegal gathering. So a very large proportion, almost a quarter of all charges against human rights defenders were around what we would consider basic civic rights like freedom of assembly. And COVID has allowed and enabled many governments to crack down on that right. But other criminal charges have been leveled against human rights defenders and including, and unfortunately, this is the tone that has been set over the last number of years, spreading fake news, smearing of human rights defenders has become a key tool in the toolkit of repressive and authoritarian governments, of which there are many, as we've just seen in the maps, in terms of clamping down on civic leaders who are simply peacefully airing the discontent or the dissent of the communities they represent. And one thing that is very alarming is the ongoing and increasing use of anti-terror legislation or simply just allegations of terrorism against civil society, which has a number of effects. One, if legislation is applied, they tend to be criminal proceedings brought against people, which can be very, very harsh. But also even the tag of terrorism can be very stigmatizing and can erode trust that the public at large has in civil society. So here is maybe just one very recent example. So people are probably aware that quite recently the Israeli government alleged charges of terrorism against six Palestinian NGOs without giving any evidence as to why that was this, these charges were being leveled against them. But what it means is those organizations cannot receive funding, are liable to be shut down at any moment, that anybody who expresses support for them is alleged to be complicit in, uh, in, in supporting terrorism. So this is very, very serious. And especially when there is no evidence being given. And in the past, this has happened as well, where NGOs have been alleged to have been supporting terrorism and no evidence has been produced. But what it does is it has a chilling effect on civil society because the charges are serious and the implications are very serious. And they have real security issues um, attached to them for the people who work in those organizations. But also it undermines the overall concepts as the UN experts here in this tweet um, we're very sort of exercised around because, you know, essentially 
there are fundamental human rights around the freedom of expression, the protection of human rights, um, the promotion of international humanitarian law. And designating NGOs who are carrying out this work, and this work is essential in terms of the functioning of democracies, means that we are undermining the very core of democracy. So this is just one example, but there are, there are many, many worldwide that we could cite. I was speaking just yesterday with colleagues in Honduras about the introduction of laws, not just in Honduras, but throughout Central America, that effectively clamps down on civil society, but also has a chilling effect on civil society itself and on donors who would support them. So conflict, um, another bad news uh, map, I'm afraid. Um, over the past 10, 13 years, the Global Peace Index has been produced. And what it's identified for this current year is that yet again, for the ninth year out of 13, global peace has deteriorated. So the plus symbol there is a little bit um, distracting because it has actually deteriorated by 0.7%, 0.07%. Now that is a relatively low level of deterioration compared to some previous years. But what it expresses is that we're on this slow but gradual path towards less stable, less well-functioning democracies and societies. And being aware of this is really important because it clearly has to be resisted. The other thing that I think is striking about this is just the cost of the lack of peace. The cost of conflict globally is equivalent to almost 15 trillion, which is 11.6% of global GDP. And um, the increase in violence has been driven by and accompanied by an increase in global military expenditure, which in the last year, 2020, rose by 3.7%. So just thinking about that for a minute, global military expenditure in 2020, the year of COVID, rose by 3.7%. And I'm sure we can all imagine better uses to which that could have been put, for example, COVID. Now, I won't linger long on this topic because um, I'm sure Dim, Jim and, and Dominic will comment on it as well. Um, but I think this map, again, speaks volumes. So this is a map which I downloaded yesterday. Um, so it is right up to date and it is a map of global vaccine rollout at the moment. So you can see that these, all of these countries here in this belt have achieved over 50% vaccination rates to date, whereas Africa, to a large extent, has achieved under 10%. Most of the countries in which we work are barely achieving 3 to 4% vaccination rates. And this is not because there are no cases of COVID in those countries, as I'm sure we'll elaborate on later. Climate, and I, I won't linger too long on this, you're all very familiar with this, but Again, a map that demonstrates that the whole world is vulnerable to climate risk. The risks differ depending on where you are. So for example, the blue is flooding. So you can see the areas of the world that are, that are vulnerable to flooding. So the big floodplains there in Bangladesh, other areas here where you have major rivers flowing into the sea. Here, South Sudan is already inundated and has been for several months. Heat stress, you see in areas where you probably would expect it. Water stress there in yellow, again, you might expect it in these areas. Wildfires in red, hurricanes and typhoons in light blue, the ring of fire in the Pacific, um, and sea level rise in areas which it would affect Ireland as well. So the point of this is that clearly there are risks to everyone globally from climate change, but the risks are not equal. So what this map shows is where is the concentration of people who are most vulnerable to climate risk? And again, they're in the countries that are affected by conflict, that are affected by deep poverty and increasing poverty. They're also the countries in the areas which certainly here are least benefiting from public health measures that the global uh, economy, global society should be addressing as a matter of urgency. Um, <clears throat> COP, how can I not speak about COP? It just finished. Um, I'm sure we'll get into this in more detail. Just to say 1.5 was kept alive just about. So the analysis of pledges before COP were that we were going to produce um, 52 gigatons of greenhouse gas emissions, emissions based on our, our pathway prior to COP. The pledges at COP reduced this to 41.9 gigatons, but there's still a huge gap. We need to get down to 26.6 gigatons of emissions by 2030 to stay on course for 1.5. So a lot of work done in pressuring our global leaders at COP. There was some good news for sure, but overall it was a big disappointment on one issue that's very important to the people that we work with in low income countries, and that is loss and damage. 
because the reality is that we've been working on adaptation and mitigation for many, many years. We need to do a lot more work, especially on adaptation. But at this point, so much damage has been done and is irreversible to infrastructure, to people's lives. And this has to be paid for. There are real costs that countries and citizens who did the least to cause climate change are suffering from and will continue to suffer from. So there's a financial deficit that still exists and we may well speak more about that. Um, I, the answer to this question, I think it's obvious, but you know, who's responsible for most emissions? It is the rich countries. I borrowed this from Oxfam. Thank you very much, Jim. And I know there's lots of excellent material and analysis from Oxfam and concern on this issue. But this just demonstrates that the richest 10% of the global population are responsible for global emissions. And the, the people who are most impacted, but least responsible for the emissions are down here in the poorest uh, quintile. One thing that I thought was really interesting, and if anybody hasn't seen it, it is worth watching. It is an almost three minute clip of Mary Robinson speaking at the COP the day after an analysis was produced, which said that even with what was being discussed at, at COP, we were on track for 2.4 degrees rather than 1.5, or as had been spoken about to them, 1.8 degrees um, warming. And Mary Robinson, in three minutes, pretty much lifted the lid on what happens at multilateral fora in terms of negotiation. And she clearly named another a number of countries that were blocking progress on something as important as reducing emissions. Um, so if you haven't seen it, we can come back to it, but if you haven't seen it, I would certainly look it up. And then this is the last topic I want to touch on, but it's a big, big issue within the sector. It's something that might not be as visible to people outside the sector, but it's important. And that's localization, decolonization, and racial justice. So in brief, for the last number of years, we've been very concerned about equality, diversity and inclusion and anti-racism in the sector. This was highlighted following Black Lives Matter protests now coming up to a year and a half ago. But a major report was done by Peace Direct, where they interviewed many, many people um, working within the sector about structural racism and how it shows up in the sector. And the analysis was shocking but perhaps not surprising because the development in humanitarian sector is no different from any other sector of society and is susceptible to structural racism. So it's a big challenge for us as a sector to address structural racism within the sector as well as within the societies we work in. And here in Ireland there's a number of really interesting pieces of collateral and analysis being produced. So I just grabbed two from DOHUS which is our um, umbrella body one is a blog, the story of um, a woman called Michelle Hesso, who moved from India to Ireland. She's an indigenous woman. She's a development worker. And what her experience was of trying to enter the development sector in Ireland, and it is illuminating. And the second is a very recent, it was launched just yesterday at an, at an event that Doak has hosted, a piece of analysis by Ailish Dillon in Maynooth University on how we communicate a message within the Irish context on development issues and how we really need to raise the bar in terms of our standards in order to align well with an ethic around equality, diversity and inclusion in a much more multiracial and um, inclusive Ireland. Localization, we can speak at, on, on this um, in more depth if we have time, but this is really important. In 2016, we had the World Humanitarian Summit, and one of the biggest themes of the World Humanitarian Summit was localization, which is essentially how can we make sure that the local civil society organizations who almost inevitably are the first responders to a crisis and who almost inevitably remain there after international players may have long departed, certainly in, a, in an acute emergency situation which is not long lived, how can we make sure that they actually, that the power shifts towards them? And commitments were made around ensuring that money would flow to local civil society organizations. But it's more than the money. It's not just about financial resources, though that is key. It's also about ensuring that decision-making power, influence, the ability to advocate and to achieve change shifts more towards those organizations that are located in the context within which traditionally organizations like ourselves have worked in as well but effectively too much of the space is being taken up still by international agencies, by the voices of people who are from outside the context and not enough influence is available to our space for influence is available to people within their own context to be agents of change in the environments that they live in, work in and know best. So last slide, in summary, what do I think is important? What, 
what does the future look like? What should our response be? So the first thing to say is that we have to get the fundamentals right as development and humanitarian agencies. So what is that about? That is about making sure that we deliver responsive, accountable, transparent and human centered programs of work that enable people to achieve their rights through their own agency. We have to do this as well as we possibly can. There are technical standards that we hold ourselves to account around whatever dimension of the sector it is, whether it's livelihoods, gender equality, humanitarian response protection. The sector is very sophisticated now around standards and around accountability, and we have to strive to achieve the very highest standards in both. In terms of the context and the contextual issues, really these are the game changers because these define what we do and how we do it and how impactful we are. So what we need to do is we need to continue to promote, defend and protect human rights and international humanitarian law. We need to do that both within the context we're in, but also supporting the multilateral mechanisms that exist to promote and protect human rights and IHL. As a sector, we need to engage in and promote meaningful localization, decolonization and racial justice work. Decolonization is a term which it can be it can be contentious. I am quite comfortable with it. Um, it's maybe easier for people in Ireland to be comfortable with it than people in other countries. But I think it's a very real challenge in terms of the concepts that that adhere to it, if not the actual wording. And then lastly, and of course, there are many other things you could define as game changers. But we need to continue to mobilize for climate justice. That gap is not going to go away on its own, the one between the, the gigaton gap or the finance gap. So we as agencies really need to continue to get behind the communities whose support you, you know, des is deserve who deserve our support. And given that we are housed in the global north where most of these problems have been generated, it's our responsibility to provide that support. So Professor Walsh, I'll stop there. Okay, thank you very much, Quiva. So as a, an excellent uh, overview of our dystopian futures, maybe <laughs> this is the paths that we're going on, but um, maybe we can change with the agency to change it. Um, so our next speaker is uh, Dominic McStory, who's CEO of Concern Worldwide. Dominic studied law at Queen's University Belfast before joining Concern in 1982 as part of their extensive, extensive refugee operations on the Thai Cambodian border. Over the next three decades, he went on to lead concern responses to some of the world's most devastating humanitarian emergency, including Rwanda, Kosovo, Afghanistan, Darfur, and the Democratic Republic of Congo, Haiti, and Iraq. Uh, prior to his appointment as CEO in 2013, Dominic represented concern at the UN in New York and with major donors in Washington, D.C., and continues to serve on the Interagency Standing Committee, the highest level humanitarian coordination forum. Uh, Dominic was awarded an OBE in 2009 in recognition of all his service to international humanity, to, to, human, to, to humanitarian aid, and two years later he was honoured by the Northern Ireland All Party Group on International Development for his outstanding contribution to international humanitarianism. So Dominic is a, a very experienced humanitarian, um, he's very passionate and committed to social justice and very much his, his life is dedicated to end global hunger and poverty. So the floor is yours, Dominic. Perfect. Thanks very much. I'm very sparingly use the OBE thing. It's because I have a British and an Irish passport. And uh, it's funny because, uh, yeah, I was awarded that on behalf of concern. But it's kind of it's it's something that resonates really well in the US. And I tend to never talk about it here. Um, but anyway, thank you for going through that. And thanks to Task. Uh, for organizing this really important uh, discussion. Let me just say, I it's great to be on the panel with my colleagues, uh, Quiva and Oxfam. I think as a starting point, we need to be very proud uh, of our uh, NGO sector. And particularly when I talk about our international NGO sector, I think the quality of what uh, all of us as organizations are doing and the partnership with Irish Aid is almost unique um, uh, in comparison to many of the other uh, donor partnerships. And I think also, uh, just to frame the comments, um, I think it's really important that we link back in uh, our own shared understanding and history. Um, I think as Irish, but international organizations, important to kind of root back to where we've come from uh, in relation to you know, a country that was colonized, that overcame poverty, that overcame hunger. So I think these are often uh, the things that we need to recall 
and legitimately uh, are things that we need to share uh, with other nations that are struggling about our own story of recovery, our own story of overcoming, um, and how that lends to those countries uh, that are that are um, uh, going through, uh, in many cases, as devastating, if not more. But I guess my comments are just going to focus predominantly a little bit on preventing famine and particularly to responding to the food insecurity uh, as a result of COVID. But as Quiva said, she's rightly pointed out the complexity. You can't take COVID out of conflict, out of inequality, out of climate, uh, because it is that recipe that all of us are dealing and responding to. But I guess COVID, you know, the true impact is not going to be known for some time, but we know that it is devastating and we see it across all the communities we're working in. We were part of a survey, we're part of this alliance 2015, it's a group of eight uh, international European based organizations that work in 90 odd countries, um, where we collaborate a lot on our work and on our messaging. But we joined them last year as part of a survey of 16,000 households across 25 countries um, to look at multiple aspects of COVID at a household level. And that result, in short, really talked about uh, predominantly about uh, all aspects. But the key on that was the impact of women and particularly impact of women working in the informal sector. And the message was, if we don't work today, we don't eat tonight. Um, and secondly, the impact of that was women, mothers were eating least and last to try and survive, to ensure that their children at least uh, and 60% of women had cut meals um, at this age. And this is a year old, and this has now already been amplified. So already we know the world is going in the wrong direction. 270 70 million people estimated to be food insecure or at risk. And that's a leap of 81% since the onset of COVID. Um, so as we said, we can't blame the virus for everything. Um, but if you look uh, on a conflict, I think it's an important thing is conflict is still the biggest driver of hunger globally. Climate and COVID are massively amplifying this. But if you look at the countries most at risk, they were all experiencing conflict induced hunger before the pandemic. So Afghanistan uh, is a classic example uh, where now you've got this uh, toxic mix coming together. I think it's worth saying Somalia currently, and you know the, the, the ranking is on the uh, Integrated Food Security Phase Classification, NGO terminology, IPC3 for short, there are only five bands, uh, IPC1 is secure, IPC5, famine. So Somalia has 3 million people already in IPC3, that is already 20% of households are struggling, have huge gaps, are already going into coping mechanisms and malnutrition is already on the up. Um, and uh, in the southwest of the country, where we already started seeing populations on the move, moving in towards uh, internally displaced camps. So all these things are happening. We're seeing them, we're tracking them, we're aware, aware of them, we're trying to raise flags around what is happening, what should be happening to prevent. Kenya is the same, failed rains, uh, the short and long rains. In October last year, there were 600,000 people in IPC3. Okay, this is a big red flag. This already has jumped up to 2 million, right? And insufficient action. Haiti, 12% of the population uh, is in uh, IPC4. That's one step away from famine. We know what's happening in there. It's conflict, it's uh, climate, uh, it's COVID. I think there are something like 45,000 people only who have been um, vaccinated. Uh, and Haiti is not a good example of one of the many uh, where uh, countries are lagging way far behind. Anyway, look, we know it's bad. We know it's going to get worse. In summary, humanitarian needs are going up. The levels of funding um, relative to that, even though that has increased relatively, that's going down. And I think in, in one of Quiva's slides there, you know, there was a very important statistic of the global humanitarian appeal, which stands at 36 billion, is 15 million funded. So it's less than 50%. But if you bring that down to certain countries, take Central Africa Republic, for example, it's less than 20%, or Haiti, less than 20%. So this is the first thing I would say is, 
what we need to do is close the funding gaps now. The money is there, it's just not there where it needs to be. And it is it really should be that simple. Immediately fund every global humanitarian appeal because they are now structured not on what the real needs are, but increasingly of what they think they might be able to get. So in Central Africa Republic, when I said to the head of the UN, you only have less than 40% of the budget that you needed, which was for essential. What do you do? He said, you cut everything and you start with the expensive things. He said, protection, gone. Education, gone. Gender-based violence, we we'll probably won't get to it. We look at the big things he said around food. He said, and you will go from two, to two rations a day down to one in the knowledge that you're going to be pushing people, particularly women and girls, into negative coping mechanisms. What he said to me was, with such low levels of funding, we've become firefighters. We can only go for the most acute. We have to leave the moderate ones today who in turn become the most acute need tomorrow. I would say that a big bright light in Central Africa Republic is Irish aid funding. We now have the guarantee and the confidence of a five-year funding cycle, which is almost unheard of in many of the donor organizations. So can you imagine how you go in to communities and say, we're here for five years. We're not living off a six-month grant or a nine-month grant or a one-year grant. And that changes, transforms the way you plan, what you can do. You can look at all the kind of things around rebuilding peace negotiations, community resilience. It's on a very different planning cycle. And it's an example, I think, of what Irish Aid needs to be pushing and pressurizing for other donors. Flexible, long-term funding to meet chronic long-term crisis, not short-term funding uh, that gets uh, pulled. I think the elephant in the room for many of us has been the cuts from FCDO, the UK government. Um, I have to say that we were getting about 25 million a year. We lost about 8 uh, million. And the process for that was disgraceful. Uh, it, was, it was immediate. Uh, uh, there was very little consideration given to programs that were starting. And we've had to cut back across Malawi, Somalia, Bangladesh with uh, dire consequences for the poorest communities. So you know, we have to ensure that this doesn't happen again. We have to hold that, uh, uh, donors on that kind of behavior to account. Uh, and uh, this is a key thing that we, we are, need to work on. Um, I want to touch on a couple of other things. I think media is an important factor in this. Um, we've had five years of media here in Ireland that, and across Europe that has been consumed uh, for the first number of years by Brexit. Now it's consumed by COVID, but it's COVID at a domestic level predominantly. Um, and while we have famine back again, back where we thought it had been consigned to history. It is now appearing in multiple things. It's not getting the airtime and it's not getting the attention that it should. So unlike genocide, famine does not demand a formal global response, but it should at minimum command public attention. And public attention is lacking at the minute. And it's really hard to cut through on a story with hunger. And while humanitarian organizations are increasingly under fire for broadcasting images on the effects of starvation, we know that the reality of famine is far worse than any charity ad. And so we really need to think about this because you know you ask about the Irish public is hugely generous, right? Uh, and continues to be. Um, but the reality is there is so much noise in there, out there, that Somalia 10 years on, uh, there was no public outrage at a political or a public level. Yemen and the images of starvation uh, should have been more than a weekend story on our front cover of Time magazine. The locusts in Africa that affected 20 million last year has to be more than a headline. Because the truth is, you need to get the public behind these. We're working on a new campaign called Nothing Kills Like Hunger because we want the younger generation to understand it's not just only about climate, it's also about conflict. It's also, particularly in Ireland, draw back to where your own DNA and your own history comes from. 
and here's about trying to educate the young populations uh, across the world about what they can do, particularly to back uh, the kinds of initiatives that are being promoted by uh, um, Ireland and the Security Council. And like two last points, we need to challenge the global ambivalence to peace, uh, uh, peace building. We've got to put muscle back into the surge up for diplomacy that was called for by the Secretary General. And actually, Ireland gets this and has made it a central part of its Security con uh, Council agenda. I mean, you just need to look at some of the comments that were coming out from Geraldine Bernason and Simon Coveney, who talked about famine is unconscionable, the use of hunger as a weapon of war is unconscionable, we have a collective responsibility, the Council has a collective responsibility to see famine become a thing of the past. And we have a number of opportunities to build on, including the work that's been done by Ireland and Niger as focal points on conflict and uh, hunger at the Security Council. I would say the appointment of Martin Griffiths is very welcome. He is coming in as head of OCHA and the ERC. He has a deep understanding of conflict, of diplomacy, of negotiations. And he is looking, yesterday's discussion with him was around where the donors stand in relation to sanctions. And the fact that we now have Canada and the UK who are predominantly not supporting uh, any kind of significant donor uh, funding going in for humanitarian into Afghanistan. He is now pushing the agenda, which we know very well, about trying to develop a roadmap to deal with the Taliban that one, recognizes the imperative and the importance of humanitarian coming in, two, recognizes that you need to start creating funds to enable institutions such as hospitals, such as schools, such as teachers and nurses to be paid through a system which currently now is being blocked by some donors, three, to the point where you're starting to look at some kind of rebuilding. And the reality is, can you, the question that's being asked, strengthen institutions um, that don't necessarily require investment in the Taliban. And these are the kind of debates and discussions that have to be had, and they're tricky, but there's a lot of learning from other contexts where you can set up funds, where you can channel funding in, because the net result is the communities, those that don't get on planes, uh, those that are suffering, are slipping really, really fast. And unless there is a humanitarian network that is spread, the UN, frankly, needs to have a position in every province. Um, and we have got to, we've got to engage and we've got to work with that. I would say that um, my last comment is, I think we're back to a world we thought we'd left behind. The humanitarian community is underfunded, overstretched. Localization is absolutely the right ambition, but there are a lot of structural barriers as well, even within the donors in terms of the levels of compliance and in the context we're working in. Because in truth is, you can and should be, uh, you should never be doing direct operations. You should be working through partners in contexts such as Bangladesh and Pakistan, but in places like Yemen and the Central African Republic, that journey of localization is going to be much longer. And it's not going to be easy and it's going to be a bumpy ride and risks have to be taken. But I think we need finally a radical rethink of how we tackle crisis. And the key thing for me is prevention. And the level of investment that is going in to prevention is grossly insufficient. And we are doing fantastic work. One example, building resilient communities in Somalia, implementing it with a whole series of uh, organizations. The central ethos is a no regrets approach designed to ensure that there is never a repeat of the disastrous famine of 2011. So instead of responding to an emergency based on certainty, you respond proportionately to the probability of a disaster and it's working. And so is cash directed into the hands of women. And so is community management of therapeutic care that Irish aid uh, uh, supported in the thing. All of these things are working. All of these things need to be scaled up. It's not a question of reinventing because in truth, we are failing to appropriately scale up the evidence and the knowledge that we have. And we need to use this and political pressure to end this cycle of response, crisis, response, crisis. And in that, we need to bring the public on this journey and tell him there's a huge amount out there that is very positive. Let's just get behind this and let's resource it. Thanks.
Okay, thank you very much, Dominic. So that's excellent. I'd love to sit down and talk about those issues, just like with Quiva, but I'm just conscious I want to give Jim a chance to talk. And then there's some very good questions that are related to those topics and the topics Quiva brought up as well. So I want to get to them. So, but excellent. Um, so Jim Clarkson, CEO of Oxfam Ireland and uh, Executive Director of Oxfam International. Jim is a leading commentator on, um, oh, sorry. He's a commissioner at the Irish Human Rights and Equality Commission and has recently been appointed to represent Ireland at the EU Fundamental Rights Agency. Uh, he was appointed by the Count Corla to a forum on family uh, friendly and inclusive parliament uh, to recommend a transformation in the Iraq, how the Iraq does operates to ensure it is better balanced and diverse. And that's very important. It's a, that could be an entry point for SDG conversations, not just SDG five. Um, and he is a, an adjoint professor at the School of Business and Law at UCC uh, and is a regular contributor to several university programs in Ireland and international. Um, yeah, he is a frequent uh, contributor to political and public debate through advocacy and media commentary in a wide range of international forum. So high level, he has shared high level platforms with senior thought leaders as academics, politicians and UN bodies, OECD and the EU. Um, and, uh, in, in, in Ireland, he's been obviously in the Arctis and the Stormont in Northern Ireland as well. So he's a, a passionate advocate for the rights of women. Uh, Jim has driven a gender focus in all of Oxfam's work with emphasis on women's economic empowerment and participation in political and business leadership and has led the Irish Consortium on Gender-Based Violence. So the floor is yours, Jim. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Professor Watch. Uh, uh, just uh, and thanks for the long introduction. <laughs> we should have <laughs> edited that one. Anyway, uh, look, it's it's really great to be here, and I'm conscious of time. And there are some really interesting questions that have been put forward, so I'm keen for us all to get to those. So I'll try and keep my comments short uh, or short enough. Anyway, first of all, very big thanks to Task. Um, I'm a big fan of the work that you do. Uh, we constantly quote you, and we're we're very delighted to partner with you in a whole range of areas over many years. And um, obviously, for those who don't know Oxfam, we're a global confederation of 20 members. Oxfam Ireland is one of the founding members of the of the confederation. And we're, we've been present in Ireland for over 60 years. So I suppose they, you know, I'll take you on slightly a couple of slightly different tacks. I mean, first of all, the, the concern that we have is the next 10 years and what's going to happen and this enormous change and tension and contestation that will happen, which will provide lots of challenges and also some hope and opportunity and i'm going to try and finish on a bit of hope and opportunity at the end because i know that the picture that uh, i and my colleagues often paint is is one of a very grim world and you know let's not uh, let's not sugarcoat it the, the issues are tremendously uh, challenging and um, and we don't know how the the wide-ranging complexities uh, that are visible and dormant will, will play out over these next number of years, that multiple interwoven futures are possible. Uh, so we must organize ourselves to work in, in lots of different and new ways to provide this just and sustainable world, to deliver on the, the promise of the SDGs that we, we all want. And Ireland as a country has an ambitious role to play in this uh, and ex extending its global footprint with the UN Security Council and its diplomatic footprint and so on. And then us as civil society actors have a, a key role to play in influencing that. Uh, so I suppose, first of all, just looking at inequality, I mean, you know, rightly so in lots of ways, we've been so focused on on the impacts of the pandemic and what has happened over the last uh, two years almost. But the truth of it is that the, the pre-pandemic world was was not a good place. And in terms of the the deep and growing inequality uh, that has been presented by flawed economic models, and, you know, some people might be familiar with reports that Oxfam have produced over the last number of years for the for the Davos uh, Global Economic Forum, uh, demonstrating the extraordinary nature and the deep, deep nature of the uber elite who, you know, handful or 10 or 15, depending on how you measure it, people that own as much wealth as 3.6 billion people. And that's at the, the extreme ends. But then you look at it in the middle where the 1% own more than 50% of the world's of, of the world. So. And, um, you know, we have an extreme situation and, you know, it's 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 resulted in the the a lot of the, the gains that we've made uh, in fighting poverty over a long period of time from 1990 to 2015. And, um, you know, think, things had moved, but for a lot of people, 
they hadn't moved beyond the 550 a day. And in fact, in some parts of sub-Saharan Africa, the number of people earning even less has, has actually risen. So, and the, we know that the pandemic has, has challenged all countries, but it's particularly poorer countries that have, that have really been impacted. And it's, it, it, you know, there was talks originally when the pandemic happened that it was going to be some great social equalizer, not in a good way necessarily, but at least we all felt, or at least there was a sense that people were all going to be connected and all affected. Sure, everybody's been affected, but the poorest people have been the most impacted. Um, and, you know, the one, I suppose, positive that has come out of it is that hopefully there is a global sense that unless everybody is protected, then none of us are protected. And you could say the same about uh, climate and you could say the same about poverty and extreme poverty too um, our approach to poverty is is grounded in tackling systemic inequality and injustice poverty arises from the violation of people's basic human rights when someone is denied the right to own land the right to education access to basic services like clean water fair price for the crops they grow or a fair wage for the work they do the result is poverty so address, addressing poverty requires political rather than technical fixes uh, we need the political will to be there. So we believe that all lives are equal and that everyone has the right to a just and sustainable world in which everybody can thrive. So this, based on this, we work with a whole range of actors who will challenge discrimination, exclusion and exploitation. And working with communities, as, as Quiva's mentioned, and working through partnerships and working through local organizations. And certainly the, the, the face of Oxfam uh, in, in the Global South is one of a, it's a local face. And it, we have worked um, substantially in recent years to transform our own internal organization to make it globally balanced. So we, we introduced new affiliates to our confederation in South Africa, in Colombia, in India, in, in Brazil, and others to come on stream in the next while, in China, stroke Hong Kong. So, you know, we've transformed the, the organization that we are, and we see that that is vital to ensure that the voices at the table making the decisions in a big global confederation like ours are balanced and have very strong southern uh, perspective and, and strength. Um, we also apply a feminist and an anti-racist lens uh, throughout our work to understand the challenge and the systems of power that perpetuate this inequality. Recognize that the international development system itself uh, can and frequently does reinforce inequality. And it was very interesting, the, the cases that uh, Quiva brought up earlier that, you know, and including this leg legacy of colonialism, and I, I'm not, uncomfortable with that term at all and I think we need to grapple with it and we need to understand it um, but as Oxfam we try to acknowledge our own privilege and uh, adapt our actions to amplify the voices of those who are most excluded and also to put the hand up where we make where we where we get it wrong and we have have gotten it wrong in the past um, so you know these growing inequalities increasing the stress from climate crisis and polarization they're fueling tensions that undermine social cohesion so we see, as has been described, these humanitarian crises are becoming more frequent, complex and protracted. And the funding, as, been, as has been mentioned, has dramatically dropped and the awareness has dropped and the, the public space for these discussions has dropped. So we need to look to see how do we cut through. And part of the way that we look to do that is, I suppose, is to is to give a sense of universality to the challenges that we face, whether they be climate, whether they be inequality, whether they be COVID um, and, you know, many other issues. Um, and, and, you know, I think if we can do that and if we can get the solidarity of Irish people, because so many people, when you, when you frame it in a way that, that makes sense in their own real lives, albeit the challenges are very different and very extreme in the global South and in the, the countries in which we work, that some of the issues and many of the issues are similar. Take gender justice and we talk about, I mean, look at the journey that it has taken, the, the length, the hundred years plus that has taken Ireland in its in it, as a new country to get anywhere near to, to some form of, of equality. And we're still a very long way off. I mean, we have shockingly low levels of political participation, far lower than many sub-Saharan African countries, 23%. And, you know, and that's just one example. Look at look at the, the gender pay gap in this part of the world uh, and, and many other issues. And then look at the, the legacy of the of the mother and baby homes and all these kind of things that are coming now to the fore and rightly so. And the sense of of redress and justice that needs to be there on, so that you can move forward because you can't move forward until you until you tackle the past. And then you look at uh, 
you know, forced migration, which is, you know, happening at a scale never seen before, and the impact that that's having having across the world, uh, primarily on those who ha- are forced to flee, of course, but also, you know, the, the the communities more so in the global south again, that that uh, have to support people who who are forced to flee, and our responsibility towards them, and and how do we, you know, how do we make sure that throughout this the system from the from the pre-conflict to the pre the pre-crisis all the way through to when people are forced to get on a boat and then the way we should welcome them to a wealthy country and a wealthy place part of the world that we live in and then we see things like uh, digital so digital revolution is transforming lives the way we live the way we work and we, we relate to each other i mean look at what we've managed to do in the last year and a half sitting in in my room here you know speaking to you and being able to work from here and um, and it is it can be an amazing power for good but where it is equal and safe and access to technology it can change the lives of people living in poverty but we also know there's a huge divide between those with access to digital technology and those uh, without uh, which risks amplifying existing inequalities uh, data and digital rights are a new untested human rights frontier and it's a it's a it's an area that we're starting to to do a lot of work on because you know in our in our work in all of our work we, we use uh, digital uh, data collection and and an element of sharing to to donors or to 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 those who are funding programs and we have to be extremely careful about how that's done and and the digital rights of those who are involved and um, and then we, you know, we look at, you know, the kind of the kind of issues that we see here, where, you know, Ireland, their their social imbalances are quite dramatic here. I mean, the homeless crisis in Ireland is is at an all time high. We've seen a lot of um, disconnection from the political mainstream, a lack a lack of confidence um, in political leaders to develop real change, um, but. But still, Ireland has has shown how it can mobilize as a community to to protect itself and to protect our most vulnerable, particularly, but to protect everybody against COVID and the things that we're willing to do. And it was very interesting, I think, Quiva's point about, you know, when you have a mature uh, democracy, uh, people have a level of trust. But, you know, there are there are still plenty of things that need to be worked on to transform that i mean ireland's international space and its credibility rightly credibility on human rights climate uh, on issues of gender equality humanitarian support and it's and it's very strong the very strong role it's taking the un security council is very powerful but also ireland has weaknesses in terms of its global tax record its climate action and that will remain to be seen in the next you know in the in this next phase and it's vital that that we you know, rapidly scale up our own, not just our own financial contribution, but 100% that has to happen, as has been mentioned, but also our own mitigation strategies and, and how we do transform the way we live and work and travel, etc. But there, all this disruption does offer opportunities, and I think it's important to focus on them and to remember those. I mean, we've seen extraordinary mobilization of young people and youth over the past uh, decade now, I suppose, in, uh, particularly in terms of climate, and we're seeing a whole new generation of activists and people who care about social good, and they've come in through that very specific space, but they're seeing it then as a wider uh, social cohesion and a wider movement that's required to tackle inequality and to tackle you know, the big issues facing ourselves. I think feminist movements are becoming increasing, increasingly visible and you know, holding that power and retaining you know, holding holding others to account. And I think the the narrative around feminist movements, Me Too, Repeal the Eighth, and so on. And then you look at the the impact of Black Lives Matter and the the the, the transformation of the external narrative in relation to diversity, uh, equality, race, and so on. Um, I think these present us with great opportunities. So the the public appetite to engage and to become involved has not lessened. I think it's possibly stronger than it has been for for a time but it's how do we hone that into a way that can make a, a global transformation particularly in the spaces in which we work how do we you know as well as you know rightly acknowledging the the vital fights and battles that need to happen in the global north how do we ensure that there is that sense of solidarity and connection and connectivity to the issues that we 
we need to to fight. So, look, there's a there. I, I kept it brief. There's a lot, a lot. I think that we can and should and need to be doing. Uh, I think we need to always hold a mirror up to ourselves. Uh, you know, both here and wherever we work, and um, and then look to also new partnerships. I mean, they're the business community are an interest, a very interesting group that are now really passionate about a lot of the issues on the SDGs. And they have the resources, they have the capacity, they have the, the human capital, um, and they have the profit motive to drive them into places that we wouldn't be able to do. So how do we how do we ensure that that can happen, but in a way that still protects human rights and protects protects the planet? So they're, they're you know, inside are all of those grim kind of realities of what the world is facing there are lots of opportunities and how do we as a sector how do we really embrace those and engage with those and evolve and adapt and and move ourselves into those spaces thank you jim so they're excellent perspectives um so i have questions um i, I i'm going to take maybe i'll just take what, this first one first to see your view because i think it's quite important and this is just looking at what the Irish government should be doing on these issues, you know, particularly for the global south. But the way I like to frame it a little bit is that we have SDG 17.2, and we've struggled to get to 0.7 of ODA as a percentage of GNI, right? We're only at 0.32 now. Maybe the highest we've ever been at was before the crisis, financial crisis, maybe about 0.59. But there's one statistic that's also in 17.2, which is not only have you to be at 0.7, of ODA to GNI, but you also have to be between 0.15 and 0.25 of ODA to GNI for the least developed countries. And Ireland is currently only at 12. And I, uh, the OECD, DAC, and I find that surprising, right? So my kind of understanding the rhetoric around Irish aid um, was always that there was a focus on the, the poorest of the poor and the least developed countries. But now only 12% uh, of the aid that we give can be categorized to the least developed countries. And it's just given that what we've heard here today, it's not just the level of funding, but seeing the, the nature of funding somehow has shifted from 2008. And are you guys aware of that? Have you been lobbying against it? Um, or, or, or what's your feeling on that? Well, maybe I'll go first, Professor Walsh. I mean, the first thing that I would say is that you're absolutely right that, you know, it's nearly 50 years, it's over 50 years, in fact, since the target of 0 0.7 was set. And it is almost the same amount of time since the first um, Irish government that made a commitment to it, um, made such a commitment, and it's never been achieved. And it is a percentage of GNI. Mm. So it is something that can be planned for and put in place. It is not so volatile that it is not an impossibility to achieve. Um, the reality is that we work on very short political cycles in effect. So it is important that the programme for government included a commitment to 0 0.7 in principle. It is important that the most recent budget included an increase and um, working towards 0 0.7. But there needs to be, the, unfortunately, the pressure needs to be maintained every year on the government in order to ensure that, that a pathway is achieved and it tends to get knocked back very um, very quickly um, at times of crisis. So, so it is a problem because like Ireland achieved its seat on the UN Security Council by virtue in large part of its reputation as a country that is impartial on key political issues, that has a history of colonization, that has a history of very high quality development and humanitarian work. But 0 0.7 is a key marker of that commitment. So for example, the UK was rightly criticized last week at the COP summit for its slashing of ODA. Now, Ireland, I would hope, would never be so, so blunt to do something like the UK has done. And it has a different style of political leadership in general. But nonetheless, we have to hold a mirror, mirror up to ourselves. On the LDCs, I'm interested in that statistic. And I think it, maybe it bears a little bit more unpacking because it does surprise me because one of the things that Ireland always scores highly against when we are analysed in the, um, the regular OECD reports is the commitment to poverty, the commitment to basic rights, the commitment to basic needs. So um, perhaps it's that it's just we have only achieved 0.12% of GNI in expenditure on LDCs, but perhaps the overall expenditure as a percentage of our aid is higher. I'm not sure because I don't have the figures clearly in front of me, um, but it's certainly the narrative from the Irish government, obviously DFA, but the Irish government is a narrative which reinforces the responsibility of countries like Ireland, like our European colleagues, towards 
the least developed countries and low-income countries. Mm. So, can, do, Dominic or Jim, or would I move on to the next? That was a comprehensive answer. We'll move on. Um, so another question was, you know, like I think we all we're very lucky in Ireland. You know, we can be critical of the government and government responses. Uh, but look, we're so lucky in Ireland that we were able to pay wage subsidies, you know, to keep businesses alive and to, to the, the pulp, you know, people could stay at home and, and get an income. It's just it's shocking to think that you couldn't borrow to fund a health service or that you couldn't have any social protection program. And this is what most countries around the world have faced. So the question is that should we when we're thinking of in the immediate future um, and we're thinking of helping the global south? That there could be a drive towards COVAX, for example. Let's just put all the money in, into the vaccine. Let's put all the money into this crisis. Uh, but I think Dominic kind of was kind of warning us about that, right? So what do you think of that sort of idea that this is the moment just to fix your money on global public health, get that right, and 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 then think about all the other issues later? Um, I'll come in on that one, and if I may, because uh, <laughs> I've just I've just uh, come come off a call, uh, come off a a, a meeting of um, uh, immunologists, science, science, uh, scientists and uh, medical professionals across uh, across the globe uh, as part of the People's Vaccine Alliance. And we, we the event is actually still running now. Um, and, you know, I, I think sometimes there are some some false choices that are that are put out there as an either or. I mean, we we strongly believe that the that the answer to the, the vaccine inequity issue is simply to produce more vaccines and there's a there's a mechanism that is possible to make that happen uh, and it's called a waiver a trips waiver uh, to the world trade organization rules uh, a temporary waiver and the resistance comes from the pharmaceutical industry and and from governments and i'll come to that in a second and it it is based on this kind of false notion that if you suddenly do that, the, the entire pharma industry will collapse. Now, the entire pharma industry didn't collapse when we did exactly the same, same things to treat uh, HIV and AIDS uh, 20 so years ago. Um, so there's this, this is very possible and doable. Unfortunately, Ireland is one of the countries that's resisting this. Um, so if Ireland and the EU supported the TRIPS waiver, it wouldn't cost Ireland anything, by the way. Um, what it would do is it would enable uh, many, many manufacturing facilities, which we have identified across the world and across the global south, who have the capacity and the technical know-how to be able to produce vaccines to scale up rapidly and dramatically. I mean, the as you rightly say, we produced a report as Oxfam last year um, talking about the, the inequality virus, um, the hunger virus, and so on. And, and it really shows that because exactly the reasons that you mentioned, uh, countries do not have the, the resilience and they do not have the, the social protection mechanisms to, to give people an opportunity to, to you know, to, to, to work, to, to, to be protected when they lose their job. And bear in mind that such a very large percentage of people in the global south uh, have, you know, work in a, in a casual way and in, in an informal, in informal um, economies, which, you know, rely on people to be paid the same day and to, to make to, to be fed the same day and when that's when that stops it has a dramatic impact and we've seen and we've, we've seen some of the numbers earlier in terms of the needs that have dramatically spiked albeit not just from COVID alone COVID conflict and climate the three C's as we describe them but certainly we could we could easily tackle one of them and we could do it by political will rather than funding and yes of course you need to continue to fund and, and support global health uh, uh, infrastructure and global health uh, matters for developing countries and that's an ongoing uh, requirement uh, again you know how do you do that you do it through tax you do it through obviously through through aid and development but you also do it through taxation so you want to make sure that the, ta the global tax mechanisms are not preventing global uh, developing countries from accessing the tax that is due to themselves which then sh should be invested in education and health and so on so you know there we have solutions to these things they're facing us uh, and they're they're doable, but then we need the political will to to deliver on them. Excellent. Um, so I think um, the the next question I, I, is probably more for Dominic. Um, so uh, this is from Susie Fogarty. She's a advisor to Barry Andrews, who was formerly Goal in MEP at the moment. 
And he's saying, what do you think of the um, European Commission's Humanitarian Plus program for Afghanistan at the moment? Yeah, I mean, I, I think she, I think she's asking about this Humanitarian Plus. I, I guess the, certainly coming out of the discussion yesterday, what was required at a global level with the donors is a roadmap for Afghanistan that sets out a ambitious, challenging series of steps uh, that uh, over time. And that is to engage on a humanitarian level, to engage at an institutional level, and potentially further down the line uh, at the diplomatic recognition level. But nobody is really getting to that point at the minute. I, I think it's more around, uh, I think we have seen, frankly, um, uh, uh, if you look at the, the different donors, you look, go back to this 36 billion the price tag for providing uh, uh, humanitarian assistance. When you look at who the biggest donors to that are, the, e, uh, the US, US government, USAID, uh, contributes over 40% of that. When you get down below that, just under 10% is the EU and Germany. And then the UK gets down to something like four and then below that. So the question I think with the EU is, they need to be stepping up on multiple levels, at a political level, at a financial level, at a much more influential level, because we're not hearing that. I know there was an earlier question that was coming in about what's happening in Poland and uh, the EU thing. And we've seen consistently, you know, that the opportunity for the EU as a collective to step up and speak out and challenge and fund and influence uh, isn't sufficient. So we're not seeing that level of leadership there. We're not seeing it with Canada. We're not seeing it specifically around Afghanistan. We're not seeing it with the UK. Um, Ireland, I think, has done extremely well uh, in the last number of months around this coalitions, um, smaller member states coming together. We know that the UN as a system and a whole is deeply flawed. We know that the permanent five is no longer representative. Uh, of the world that we're living in. We know that that power shift has remained rooted and stuck, and even Antonio Guterres, who essentially has given up reform. But I think now there are opportunities where smaller states need to be coming together around coalitions and exercising their voice. That's what has to happen. COP26 was certainly an example of those initiatives, but not failing to get in. And I think the UN, this is this is where we need to be exercising much more. I think, mean, am I hopeful about Afghanistan? I am really not hopeful over the next couple of months. Am I hopeful about Ethiopia? I'm really not hopeful because none of the senior diplomats are engaged at this early stage sufficiently. We know coming from Ireland, you end up having to talk to people you fundamentally do not like. In fact, you may have polarized Things. But that doesn't mean to say conversation shouldn't be, happen shouldn't be happening. So again, I think Ireland on the diplomacy side can and should be exercising a, um, uh, a leadership role in this. It's something that we can draw from our own history. Yeah, excellent. Um, so there is an interesting question, but um, I, I, I don't think it's particularly just targeted at NGOs. You can point the finger at philanthropic organizations and, and universities and, and equity funds that are trying to do ESG, et cetera. But uh, Dominic had an interesting conversation about the narrative and it's, it's, it's kind of frustrating, uh, particularly to Dominic, I'm sure, that it's like the threat of famine and what's happening with conflict. And we all know it, we, we, we've, we've been through Amatia Zen's work. We, we all know the, what causes famine. Um, somehow is just not in the conversation because it's all about climate and COVID and, and, and other things that are going on. But there's a kind of a question, um, like what are these entities doing for the global south? Like NGOs in particular, but you could put that question to, to all of us. Um, and what sort of, how would you get that narrative going again? You know, like using modern communications, et cetera, or like, are, are, we, are we value for money? Are we seen as people who get state money that are not value for money? Or, you know, are we getting, 
and getting the young people going on this issue as much as they're getting going on climate change, etc. You know, and I know Dominic, you put that out there, you know, so it's probably not that you have the solutions for that, but it is an issue uh, that 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 conversation isn't out there, isn't in the media, and and it has implications. Um, but I don't know whether anyone wants to address that. I just want to say three things. The first thing I think is. Um, We've got to ensure that the language of human rights and international humanitarian law is not marginalized. I fully accept around decolonization, localization, diversity and inclusion. These are all really critically important uh, shifts that we have to think, but they seem to be spoken in the absence of international humanitarian law, of the humanitarian imperative around basic human rights that people have in relation to access. So I think we have to have those dual conversations. Secondly, we are seeing, you know, the, what happens at the UN and even within the NGOs is probably less relevant to what's happening in civil society and particularly among younger generations. So we are seeing that shift that is out there and is certainly only going to become even more emboldened after COP26 in relation to strikes and climate. So we've got to work on that. Frankly, I do think that, again, we're going back to Irish aid, but they've been funding school debates uh, uh, in Ireland for the last 40 years. We've got to ensure that that kind of funding continues. We can never be complacent about the fact that we as a society seem to have the right views and attitudes. Um, we've got to continuously work on that. And then lastly, I do think we are in a much more interconnected world. The one thing we learned about Ebola is it was one flight away. The one thing we've learned about COVID is that until everybody is safe, nobody is safe. So we've got to ensure that we build on that capital of saying interconnectedness means we can't only focus on domestic Everything now has to be through the lens of the collective. And I think those are three things that may not resolve everything, but are things that we can build on. Excellent. And um, there's a, a question by Sean McCabe, who's strong, obviously, on climate justice. So he's just thinking about Ireland's reputation um, with our corporate tax rates, you know, that we're a tax haven. And in, in some ways, like we're undermining our own sort of tax income and expenditure, but more importantly, you know, down the value chains, we're obviously undermining the tax take and spending of all the, the, the poor countries uh, where multinationals operate, et cetera. But like, is there a way to think about, like one, is this undermining our whole reputation? You know what I mean? In terms of uh, generating funds for the global South. Uh, but secondly, is this kind of an opportunity that, that we could think about how in a sense tax the rich or tax the global chain global supply chains how you know we can think of ways of getting global finance for climate justice and, and for for other issues and that uh, in a sense by always looking to government i guess and not looking at other ways to crowdsource money that um that is potentially problematic so i think oxfam are kind of strong on this right yeah well i, I look i suppose we you know let's not pretend that ireland doesn't have a global tax reputational problem it has a very serious one um, and you know it has been engaged in some of the positive measures to to look to change that um, slowly and reluctantly but it has uh, and it is you know i think it's inevitable now what is what is going to happen and, and I, I suppose there there are a number of elements to this i mean obviously there's the there's the tax rate itself which is which is a a, a challenging and and difficult place for ireland and we we understand that but there's also the, the the mechanisms that allow um companies to create brass plate organizations and i mean there was an expose just uh, two or three weeks ago it's as recent as that so it's not this isn't distant past it's still happening right the what were the, the latest papers from the paradise papers are from, from moved on where, where there's a you know specific irish companies and irish buildings were named you know housing hundreds of companies and so on so it's it's still so so there's still a huge problem there. It is still a huge problem, and and it isn't a it isn't a, a victimless crime because what it does is it it prevents, as I mentioned earlier, it, oftentimes developing countries from accessing tax that is due to them, which should which they should be investing in the in the kind of things that we're talking about here today. Uh, Ireland has a very strong reputation internationally, 
in so many of the human rights and development spaces, deservedly so, uh, and including our defense forces and the amazing work they've done for generations now. Uh, and we just we just need to continue to challenge ourselves when there are elements to that, to what we're doing that are inconsistent with that. And tax is one and climate is another. I mean, and and we we have more work to do there. And it is it is amazing to see the the level of ambition and let's see and let's hold to account. Uh, aid and development support is another, and that that kind of waves up and down. So, you know, we we just need to continue to to push and to be consistent across across everything that we do. And it's difficult. I mean, look, I you know, being being in politics is not easy, and making these very difficult calls and making these decisions. But I mean, we 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 have a an important reputation that can be influential to others also, and we can help to to inspire without sounding to to conceited that we we can help to do that if we if we do the right thing and if we're willing to to put our hands up and say look we, these are issues that we're not getting right and we have work to do albeit as part of a global network of countries and, and so on and you know but but the other thing is that there you know there's a huge response you know we have multinational companies that we know are very intentionally moving money all around the place and this is well documented um and you know we need to we need to look to that too and i you know coming back to your earlier question i i would be a bit more positive about um public mobilization it's done in different ways but it's there it's very strong it's very passionate um and it has moved things like repeal the eighth uh, it has it has it has moved the marriage equality referendum uh, it has it is very vocal on redress for for victims of of state and institutional abuse you know, so there is, and it's very, very strong on housing. So there is a there is a mobilization there. There is a very strong passion uh, in the public for change, and for fairness, and for fighting inequality. Um, and I do think that it's up to us to make those linkages to to talk about the universality of these issues, and and how we can we can work together on them. It doesn't have to be here or there, but it can be both. And Quiva, I think Quiva's come in on that as well. Yeah, maybe just to follow up on both of those points. So, um, you know, on the on the question of the the messages that the public gets from NGOs and the messages that the public maybe doesn't see, the realities that exist in the world that the public doesn't see. So, just coming back to that for a moment, it, it is horrendous that in the world that we work in, in the work that we do, there are currently fifty million people in East Africa, if you extend it across the DRC, that, as Dominic has said are at that IPC level three, which means that one or two small shocks pushes them towards famine. So it is absolutely abhorrent that there's such a low level of awareness of that. But this is a reality that we deal with. It's part of our responsibility as agencies for whom our work involves understanding and responding to that to think about, well, how do we connect with people in Ireland? How do we enable people to understand, first of all, that this is happening? But then how do we actually change the game in the long term? So one thing that we have learned, which is very clear, is that, you know, people don't relate to big stories. You know, people don't relate to the numbers that I have just been talking about. They relate to people and people relate to individual people's experiences. So you relate to the story of somebody who has you know, a family who lives in a context who has issues and who has problems. And those issues and problems somehow connect with you at a human level. So the story of a woman who is struggling to keep her children in school, or the story of somebody who's been affected by domestic violence, or the story of somebody who's unable to feed their children. You know, we can other people, or we can help people to understand that actually, you know, this is, just, this is a human issue. And it's not a question of, somebody else has something else done to them it's a question of i exist because you exist these the the theme of ubuntu from africa particularly south africa which is that i exist because you exist we are interconnected as dominic said i cannot exist without you we cannot exist without each other so we need to refine and become much more sophisticated in how we communicate in the stories that we tell we need to redress the balance between what we have traditionally done which is lean very heavily into the narrative of need which is there which is what we exist to address but what changes things is not a consistent leaning into a narrative of need it's leaning in also to the narrative of impact the fact that we can change things and we can do it together to come back to what jim has said it's very important that as ngos we understand how the world has shifted around us none of us now think that we hold the same kind of 
power and influence, if you like, that we did 20, 30 years ago, where you didn't have these movements that were able to, that, that existed, were very, very radical, very active and influence the way people think. Those movements, that is civil society in action. And we should be valuing and supporting the role of those movements, certainly never competing, never competing. Um, so it's just to underscore a few points that my, my colleagues have made there. Just coming back to the role of the private sector, the Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty has said that one of the, if not the most powerful thing that the private sector could do, as well as paying its taxes, sorry, my words, not his, paying its taxes where those taxes should be paid, just to echo Jim's point, but is actually looking at their supply chains and looking at whether there's a risk of human rights violations within their supply chains. That is the single most effective thing that the private sector, large or small, could do to deliver on the SDGs. Excellent. Um, so I think we're, we're our, our time's up. Uh, there was a, an interesting kind of question about, um, from my point of view, anyway, about the link of the universities to the NGOs and what we can do. But you know, I think business, government, NGOs, and academia could do a lot better to do the SDGs in Ireland. And we can certainly we do good stuff, but we really should be getting together and doing a lot more work on the global south. Uh, so it's it's another conversation. Um, but um, the only thing I can say in, in my defense is that a lot of the people who do the masters in UCD and development studies and sustainable development are hired by Concern, Trocra, uh, Oxfam and, um, and, and Task. So at least I supply you good quality uh, professionals to, to get your get your jobs done. Um, but we could do more. Absolutely, we could do more. Um, so just to finish up. So thank you. Um, the lovely conversation. It was great to have. I don't think I've ever been in a room with the, the three leaders of uh, Irish NGOs before. So I think that's nice. Um, uh, without others in the room, that's what I meant. Um, and uh, so thanks, Task. Uh, obviously, uh, Shauna Cohen's there as the, the CEO, and Louisa McKenzie did great work on putting this together. And there's two excellent events coming up, Conversations with Business Leaders, and that's November 22nd at 12 noon. And then there's the uh, Task 20th Annual Lecture, which will be on December 7th, uh, so I suppose now that you've signed up for this webinar, you're on the list and you'll probably get invited to those two, but hopefully you'll go. Um, but uh, it's been a pleasure and uh, uh, and uh, we're very proud of our NGOs and, and certainly uh, Dominic and Jim and Quiva, I'm very proud of all of you and all the work you do. Um, and it was a, a great conversation. So I'll end it here and, and thank you very much. And thank you everyone for attending. Thank you. Thanks very much. Pleasure to be here. Yeah. Thank you very much. Bye.